Okay, AI. Um, uh, I can pretty much predict what some of the questions will be later during the panel. Uh, do you agree with Elon or Mark? Uh, who, which of our jobs are going to get taken away? I'm, I'm actually genuinely happy to answer all of those. Uh, will Skynet take over? Um, save those up. I'm happy to answer them. Uh, the, the general uh, tenor of my answer was it's all a bunch of bullshit. So, just to hear a little preview. Um, that doesn't mean that artificial intelligence and machine learning is bullshit. In fact, it's profound. And it will have a profound impact on us as a society, uh, on our economic potential, um, and in human potential. And that's my real interest point. This is nominally a talk about AI, but really it's going to be a talk about people. Because in the end, technology is just a tool. It doesn't magically make anything better or worse. It's the choices we make. It's what we decide to do with it that really matters. Some of the choices we've made to date haven't been the best. Um, but we've got a lot of time to change that direction. Now, tomorrow, there's going to be a panel on the future of work. And uh, unfortunately, I have to fly back to California tonight, and so I won't be here. I would have loved to have helped on that panel. Uh, so I'm going to try and set it up for them by saying something a little provocative. Human capital is a toxic asset. I don't know how much a given human is going to be worth 20 years from now, but I virtually guarantee you, if we don't change the way we build people, they will be worth vastly less than we think they are. And that will have a profound and disruptive impact on our society. So these are some illustrations. I was once asked to write uh, a little op-ed about the future of work, and in the spirit of just sort of being a jerk, I instead wrote a short story about a young man, a financial analyst, who'd done everything right. He went to college, he got good grades, he worked hard, he got the right job at a great company, and it was his last day of work because a deep reinforcement network that he and his co-workers had unknowingly trained up just by doing their own job was taking their job from them. Uh, if you do want to know the uh, career paths that will be the most profoundly disrupted within, let's say, the next five to ten years, it is, generically speaking, uh, professional services. Financial advising, legal, uh, basic doctors, if you know what you're going to advise your clients before they ever walk in the door, I'm going to build an AI that's going to do it better, faster, cheaper than you. Um, but that isn't what this story has to be about. So when I talk about AI, I don't talk about how to target ads better. I don't talk about how to optimize supply chains. Those are absolutely things that this sort of work can do. But by the way, if you're really thinking about this hard, get your analytics platforms in place first. AI without your data uh, getting cleaned up is useless and worthless. Um, but if anyone has a technical question on the business side of AI, I'm happy to talk about it. Instead, I'm going to talk about human potential. And the reason why AI is such an amazing thing and how it truly can improve the world. Uh, and why, in fact, it becomes this incredibly difficult decision. So here are a couple of examples right off the bat. Um, some friends of mine build robots. These robots can visually distinguish crops from weeds. With little millimeter precision jets, they can kill the weeds while fertilizing the crops. Organic scale, or conventional scale organic farming, no humans needed. Now, Having grown up in one of the big agricultural centers of the world, the Salinas Valley in California, I actually see that as a human good. People shouldn't be bent over 16 hours a day in a field, picking food for someone else. Uh, and, you know, big surprise, none of those people look like me or my family. Uh, this is a good thing. But that's the single largest job vertical in the world. What are you going to do with all these people? Uh, some friends of mine have a company called Pacific Labs. They built a little sinogram wand, at least that's what they started on. It has deep neural networks built right into it. The minute 
the sonogram starts to run over a patient, it starts to make diagnoses. Now, you've got a choice there. You can imagine a super doctor, a general practitioner, and you walk in, and with all of your wearables, the moment you walk in the door, they're already have diagnostics running on you. They're already making predictions about your health and the right interventions. And rather than referring you out to a specialist to see a neurologist or an oncologist right there in the lab, they run this thing over you. That's an amazing option. I call this the AI bait and switch. That's the bait. The super doctor, the super teacher, augmented intelligence. Here's the switch. It's, let's call it the CFO option. So I got this wand, and it does diagnoses all by itself. Why don't I just hire three lab techs for less than the cost of the original doctor? And I get three times the productivity, three times the output. Um, yeah, maybe the results aren't quite as good, but hey, the net productivity is actually higher. Um, that's the choice we've been making as a society. It's the overwhelming trend over the last 30 years. Let's look at a couple of options uh, where AI is doing something uh, a little profoundly different. So what you're seeing right here is what we would now call a deep neural network. So I built this about 10 years be ago before that was sort of a, a term in vogue. Um, and what, it's, what you're seeing is a language of a deep neural network, a language of faces. Uh, it's a, every one of these, none of these is an actual person. It's a word in this language. And what this, uh, in fact, there are other layers in the network. Here it's learning just about the facial structure. But those other layers are learning about abstract things. Is a face competent? Uh, is a face South Asian? Uh, is a face happy? All of these abstract things get learned as well. So why did I build this during uh, my first uh, startup? Well, if you have a uh, startup in Silicon Valley and an amazing technology, then the most rational thing is to build an incredibly sleazy game called Sexy Face. So in Sexy Face, we'd show you an array of faces pulled off of Facebook, and you'd select the ones you think are sexy. And you just did a couple of rounds of this, and we'd know it. Whatever your kink, we figured it out. And our promise is, for free, we'll find everyone on Facebook you think is sexy. And for $5, we'll find everyone who thinks you're sexy. Um, now, in reality, this is what's called a Trojan. Uh, as soon as you play one round of the game, it confesses, oh, actually, this is just a mind-reading game. Pick any arbitrary face category, and we'll guess it. So, ooh, I don't know, uh, Southeast Asian, mutton chops, and a sense of ennui. And it turns out, after just a couple of rounds, we give you some faces, you select the positive examples, and after just a couple of rounds, we got it. Even the weird abstract, as long as you were consistent about how you made your judgment, even if you couldn't articulate it yourself, our system figured it out. And that was also a Trojan. What were people actually doing? They were training our network, playing, playing this stupid, sleazy, idiotic game. Uh, we used human moral corruption uh, for a good purpose. There are a million orphan refugees in camps around the world today, not in the history of the UN, right now. And at this time, 10 years ago, the UN had a book with a million photographs in it. And let's see, say you're living in Damascus, and you haven't heard from your sister's family in months, and you're fearing the worst, and you go to a refugee camp in Jordan, and they give you the book. And you start flipping through it, and boy, I hope in day seven you don't blink when your niece goes by. So we built this thing, and you reusing the deep neural network that was trained to recognize and understand faces um, with slight modification. People looked at a random set of faces of kids taken out of the book, and they selected the one that looked more like their niece, and within Three minutes, if they were in a camp anywhere in the world, you found them. This is what AI can do. Uh, it's not magic. I'm not talking about something that is smart like we are smart, 
but that is a transformation that needs to happen, because I don't know if I can think of a worse thing than being an orphan in a refugee camp. Um, this young man, uh, a group of scientists in panel, the distinguished body, determined that he was the cutest kid uh, in the history of the world. Um, <clears throat> now, admittedly, uh, my wife and I might be biased, but we are both scientists, so totally impartial. Um, so this is my son, and five years ago, he was di diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Took us by surprise. Worst. Thanksgiving ever, we spent the whole four-day weekend at Oakland Children's Hospital. Uh, and, you know, one bit of perspective is we went home. And a lot of families didn't get to go home uh, from that holiday weekend as a whole family. Um, but what really shocked me wasn't those four days in the hospital. It was a month later. So like I said, his other mom and I were both scientists. We, we crashed Google Docs. We started collecting everything. We, my son is a cyborg. We hooked him up with smartwatches and heart rate monitors. Uh, he has uh, an insulin pump, a wireless insulin pump, and a wireless continuous glucose monitors. I hacked both of those. Apparently broke several federal US laws at the time, but um, hacked those, sent the data to my server. We dropped all of this data, I mean, reams of pages of spreadsheets of activity levels and heart rate and, you know, what did he eat, Me measured down to a gram, what was his blood glucose levels, everything. And we brought a stack six inches high to the doctor's office for our first outpatient visit. <laughs> and yes, to steal a line from a really great comedian, I'm here in the future with you now also. I, I also recognize that this is was not a good idea. I thought they were going to love us. Like, oh my goodness, finally some scientists that will give us some data to work with. No, they were angry. In fact, there was a nurse who said, what the hell am I supposed to do with this? And just purely as an aside, but relevant to the topic, if in the course of your day job, you ever say, what the hell am I supposed to do with this data? That job is not long for this world. I got something to do with that data. Um, so I was shocked, and in my wild arrogance, I said, you have got to be kidding me. I build models of the brain. Are you telling me diabetes is more complex than the brain? And so with no experience, I didn't, when he was diagnosed, I didn't know the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Um, I didn't know why vague neuromodulatory um, stuff when I was a grad student, but I forgot it all because that's what you do. Uh, so I hacked all of his devices, sent all of that data to my server, and I built a model. A model that now predicts uh, over three hours into the future whether his blood glucose levels will go high or low. There was a while uh, in fact, where I wore Google Glass every day, even in the face of innumerable people coughing, glass hole, whenever you walked past. <laughs> but I built myself a superpower. You want to wear someone to wear a fluorescent blue computer on their face to a party at the White House with the president, which I did, Secret Service was not happy. Um, Build them a superpower. Google chose not to, so I built one for myself. And that superpower was anywhere in the world I knew how my son was doing. Not only now, but into the future. So we shared that uh, with anyone that asked. The coolest uh, extension of this right now is at Eli Lilly, where there's a young man there who is building what's called an artificial pancreas. Which essentially, it's just a thermostat. It's an insulin pump that turns on all by itself depending on whether your blood glucose levels are high or low. But in this case, he's building into it a deep neural network based on these predictive models. And in simulation, it's better than the real thing. It has some interesting ethical considerations. If you have a history of type 2 diabetes in your family, do you go and get now a smart artificial pancreas uh, the same way you might get a prophylactic mastectomy if you had a serious family history of breast cancer? Um, these are things that have to be decided. But what an amazing choice to make. Sometimes life is hard for my son. It is not fun having to 
when you're 10 years old and for the last five years of your life having to draw blood from yourself over and over again every day. And whenever it gets hard, I remind him, because you have diabetes, literally millions of people will be alive. Now, I don't know if that makes it easier for him, but I hope it does because it means something to me. And again, this is what you can do. This doesn't have to be just a story about self-driving cars or targeting the right news stories in a news feed. These can make profound changes in people's lives. Uh, I was asked to join the board of a company called Emoja uh, and become their chief science advisor, help them build out a set of technologies. That technology was continuous emotional state estimation. All you do is you carry your phone around with you passively. You don't have to actively do anything. Boy, let me tell you, estimating someone's emotional state would be a lot easier if I could track your Facebook behavior. Um, but no one wants to share that. So um, this was just passively carrying your phone around with you. And with the sensor set on the phone, the GPS, the gyroscope, ambient light, ambient noise, 12 other sensor signals, continually estimate your mood state. And their business model uh, was around market research, which I could appreciate. But I had an ask. When they asked me to join their board, I said, I'll help you build this if I get to use all of the data to predict manic episodes and bipolar sufferers. And one of the great synergistic moments of my life, shortly after that ask, to which they said yes, a, uh, an employee of the company at the time in confidence came to me and said, I, I heard what you said, and uh, no one else knows it, but I suffer from bipolar disorder. So if you're not familiar with bipolar, if you've ever seen the, the television show Homeland, um, uh, this is what the main character suffered from. You go ricocheting back and forth between these wild, creative manic episodes and then crashing depressions. 25% of severe sufferers go on to kill themselves. It is an endless cycle of divorce and job loss, uh, and again, for severe sufferers, institutionalization. Costs $70 billion a year in lost productivity, the most costliest mental health disorder. Um, but I have this intuition that if I could track you over time, that we could do better than that. And in fact, what we found was we could pick up on signals of an approaching manic episode three to four weeks before it ever happened. So before this person who had come to me in confidence was aware that he was headed into a manic episode. And for half of sufferers, medication does nothing. And amazingly enough, uh, the traditional treatment for manic depression, lithium, just last year was the first time someone published a paper explaining why lithium works and why it only works in about half of people. That's how little we even understood it before. So now what you're seeing here is a heat map. It's one of the signals we look into. Turns out the way people move through space, move broadly to the city of Johannesburg, uh, move through their office in their home, actually move ballistically in their local space, those turn out to be profound signals. So a month ahead of time, what if we could send a message, not just to the sufferer, but to a trusted confidant, their best friend, their sister, the doctor that they believe in, high probability of a manic episode in the next month. And you could take steps to decrease the stressors in your life. Maybe schedule a week off from work. Uh, whatever you need to do to manage that and not get divorced, not lose your job, God forbid, don't kill yourself. And in fact, uh, we have good reason from our research to believe that the same thing works for major depression, which has a similar suicide rate. Uh, it is an amazingly powerful thing to be able to take this kind of data and through the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence, be able to save a life. There's a group at Facebook, a former Facebook employees, that claim that with a simple photograph of your face, 
they can predict something on the order of hundreds of different congenital disorders uh, based on uh, the structure of the face. Now, this has yet to be demonstrated, but I've done a lot of work in face modeling, and I can actually believe that there's real traction there. What does it mean when every phone can do the diagnostic work of a specialist? That has some pretty big implications, but let's stick with the most important one, which is people will still be alive and productive in society. So this colorful little bird here uh, is not some sort of weird impressionist uh, bird of paradise. This is an online discussion forum. These are college undergrads in a biology course uh, talking about biology. It's a free-form discussion. The, uh, the forum was strictly on topic. It wasn't a social forum. But they could say whatever they want. Every week, the professor would post a question, and then students would just talk about it. So we built a deep neural network to analyze those kids talking to each other. Essentially, a bot that just passively listened to them talk about biology. And in another set of courses, uh, MBA students talking about economics. Uh, we didn't have any experts. We didn't look at the textbooks, we didn't look at their grades, we didn't look at their homeworks, we simply listened to them talk to each other. Then, for the sake of writing a science paper, we put the very simple little statistical technique, a logistic regression, based on the cognitive model we built, and it was trained to map this model onto the grade the student got in the course. Then 10,000 new students entered these two sets of courses, undergraduate biology, MBA economics. And we knew at week one what grade they would get, just by listening to them talk to each other. As the course progressed week by week, we knew with greater and greater accuracy what they would get wrong and right on the final exam, specific questions. Now, my goal wasn't to build a system that was an automated grading system. Uh, quite the opposite. If I can tell you at week three, hey, these five students are going to fail this specific question on the final exam. Well, one, you can do something about it. Right now, you don't find out until they take the exam. And two, what's the point of having the exam at all? What if we get to end all high-stakes testing and replace them with AIs that monitor kids as they actually learn? And that becomes the assessment them learning together, socially. Um, this was a pretty amazing thing. I'm very proud of what we built. Here's a dirty secret of this work. Um, shortly after we published this paper, I became the chief scientist of a company called Guild. At Guild, we built this AI to predict how good people were at jobs they'd never held. So we collected data from 100 different websites build a database of 122 million working professionals. Gallup estimates that there are about 130 million people that are actively engaged in their work worldwide, a rounding error in the global population. We had a pretty good slice of that group. And I got to build models that predicted how good you were at jobs that you had never held. Our goal was kind of ambitious, take bias out of the hiring process, Broadly defined, race and gender, absolutely. But did you really need to go to MIT to do this job? Uh, is someone that worked at Google better than someone that didn't have a brand name company on their resume? So what we found was what wasn't predictive of long-term outcomes? Grades, test scores, the university you went to, at least once I knew other things about you. Even the skill sets. Think about this tomorrow when they talk about the future of work. We define our hiring and our education system on skills. There is no skill which is robot-proof, period. Nothing. No skill or knowledge. Someone like me 
can build a tool to do it better, faster, and cheaper. Um, why do we persist in building humans to do the same thing that machines can do better? When there is a fundamental truth, which is much more exciting, which is we actually know not just what people can be to be ruler proof. And actually, in one of our earlier speakers, you saw a list, these social and cognitive qualities that we know are predictive of life outcomes. As those qualities increase in the population, people live longer, they're happier, they're more socially connected, they have increased income, greater total wealth, and even in measures of things like subjective happiness or congenital measures of health outcomes. Congenital. How you think affects how your body expresses congenital defects. That's amazing. And it has nothing to do with how we build and educate people today. That is profoundly disappointing. But it doesn't need to be. So we built this thing, and it predicted grades. And grades don't predict shit. OK, what if we can take a similarly amazing AI, let's say it's going to analyze the speech patterns of young kids, and another AI which can analyze the artwork. Oh, my daughter, she draws so many pictures that I think there are whole forests in Brazil that don't exist anymore just because of her mania for drawing. It all goes right into the compost. Um, what if you just take a picture of it? And a deep neural network analyzes that, analyzes those speech patterns, maybe asks questions of parents, and from that, make the most insane prediction you can imagine. How long will this child live? How happy will they be? How far will they go in their education? And how much of an impact will they have on the world? So it turns out the worst thing you could do is actually make such a prediction and then tell the parents. It's a cursed crystal ball. It only makes things worse. We know this, actually. Measuring people and treating them as fixed quantities, just profiling them, doesn't make the world a better place. But we built AIs to do exactly that. And uh, in a project we call Muse, what it does instead of telling their parents, hey, your kid's going to win a Nobel Prize and yours is going to flunk out, every single night, Purely via SMS, it sends them a simple 20-minute activity, a game to play with their kids, a game specifically designed for that child to maximize their life outcomes. Again, this is what AI can do. This is how AI can make better people. Um, so let's. I've talked in very glowing terms about what AI can do, but I think if you listen to everything I just said, if you were a teacher, or a, an endocrinologist, or a CIA spook. Oh, yeah, my, I learned how to do the face rec recognition stuff doing real-time lie detection for the CIA. So, um, you know, if you were a psychologist, you might actually feel a little bit threatened by some of this work. Isn't that sort of your bread and butter, is being able to check in with people and have them come in and, and make certain everyone's healthy? Um, so if you want to know what AI is in a way that's pr genuine, not what could we sometime have with what's called artificial general intelligence. Truly intelligent like us. That does not exist. No one has invented it. It's not coming tomorrow. I believe that it is possible someday, but not this day. Um, what exists today is any brief expert judgment, faster, cheaper, and better than a human. AIs won't take jobs. They're not that complex. But anything, looking at a resume and deciding whether you should hire someone, looking at an x-ray and identifying a cancer, or looking at a skin lesion, making a judgment about a facial expression. That may not sound like an expert judgment, but if you're autistic, you can't do that. It's amazing. It's a superpower. We just happen to all share it. Any simple expert judgment, better, faster, and cheaper. What happens when intelligence becomes a commodity, freely available anywhere at any time? That's the way to think about artificial intelligence today. And to clarify, it doesn't understand the problems. AlphaGo, the Beat the World Go Championships, it does not understand Go. 
it understands how to map incredibly complex patterns into a set of equally complex strategies. So complex, in fact, that no one understands how it wins its games. Um, imagine AlphaGo applied to stock markets. The one thing I can guarantee you about such a scenario is that there is going to be some AI playing the market, and such things already exist, and it's going to realize that the best way to gain a return is to short everything and crash the market. If we can't figure out what AlphaGo is doing when it plays Go, do you think we're ever going to figure out what a market playing uh, robot does if it crashes the market? We won't see any evidence beforehand. But if that's the way it maximizes its cost function, particularly if it's playing against other near optimal AIs, I guarantee you it's going to happen. So if this is the future, and it's a future we shouldn't run away from, because running away from it means accepting bipolar disorder as a norm of human existence. It means accepting diabetes. It means accepting millions of people bent over in fields every day, picking lettuce. Uh, I don't believe in that world. I believe in an augmented world. For me, AI stands for augmented intelligence. Uh, I'm not that interested in the artificial kind. Uber asked me if I would be their chief scientist. Took me like three seconds to say, hell no. Um, there's sort of a cultural nightmare there right now. But at the heart of it, it's really that I'm, I'm self-driving cars are very sexy, but I'm not that interested in them. I'm interested in people. Let me tell you, by the way, what is a lot more sexy than self-driving cars? Totally autonomous transportation networks. If you want to know where people might actually see the emergence of general artificial intelligence at scale, imagine a system that has to manage the entire transportation grid for an entire region or maybe even an entire country. How about mines? Not autonomous mining equipment, completely autonomous mines that turn parts of itself on and on against its own internal predictions of commodity prices. Uh, and we backstage, we were talking about how asteroid mining could follow the exact same process. Uh, we're going to learn about robots here in a moment, but one of the most exciting areas in AI is IoT. Not because IoT, the Internet of Things sucks, it's boring. Sorry if anyone's here is deeply invested in it. What's exciting to me is the next generation where instead of a passive platform of data collecting objects, I have a single swarm robot controlled by one AI. And by single swarm, I don't mean this building. I mean the entire network. And it is actively and probing the world. Imagine the swarm, every one of your smartphones, the smart lighting systems, the cameras, the video, audio, everything is smart and communicating with one another, and essentially testing hypotheses, constantly exploring the world. This is the system we built to improve kids' life outcomes. Imagine one single AI controlling that at scale to understand all of us in profound and deep ways. That's where smart devices start to get exciting. Um, I'm working in a couple of other areas, though, that come back to people. So I'm not going to have time to explain these, but just to touch on them, you see the big network on one side. This is, I'm at a weird place in my life where I get to be a professional mad scientist. Uh, I've done a lot of startups now, and I'm a little tired with it. So now companies come to me and they say, hey, what do you want to do with our company? And I get to do crazy stuff. Uh, so one is a potential project with Accenture to look at what we call employee lifetime value where I take data from across the entire company and treat it like a deep neural network. What does that mean? Well, deep neural network is made up of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of parameters, but it gives one output. Like the Go system has to decide whether or not to make a certain move versus another move. So how do I do what's called the credit assignment problem and assign back to those millions of units in the network the credit for that one single output of the deep neural network. It turns out it's incredibly hard, but the math exists. So we're tackling that now in the space of human capital. How do I know your value to the company? Well, it turns out 
If I can build these amazing social graphs of all of you and then track how information flows to that graph and using the mathematics of deep neural networks and what's called value-added modeling, we can actually track how you have uniquely contributed to the output of a massive multinational company without ever directly measuring you at all. I don't care whether you score any points. I don't care whether you block any shots. I care if we win when you're in the game. Right now, we do nothing like that in the way we structure our schools or our companies. This is a total transformation. Next to that, with the brains, I have another company where we're doing applied neuroscience real time on teams performing in the wild. What is the point of this? It's to create feedback loops to optimize everything about a team. We know from research diverse teams are optimal for creative problem solving. But hey, diverse teams are low on trust, low on communication. In the short term, they are not very productive. And nobody wants to pay the cost of how you get a diverse team. And by diverse, I mean cognitively diverse, creatively diverse. A lot of the traditional definitions of diverse are decent proxies for this. But how do I get a team of people that have never met before to be a high product team overnight? So it turns out one of our co-founders uh, actually led the DARPA project that did real-time neurofeedback training of snipers. They took a process in which it took six months for people to reach optimal proficiency uh, in sniper school and made it a single day. Single day, someone is as good a sniper as they will ever be. So, a bit of an experiment. Can we do the same thing with a whole high-performance team and within, let's say, a single week, make them as though they're all veterans and they know and trust each other, they speak the same language? Maybe even literally, uh, if they didn't get that right up front. Uh, next to that, with the faces, uh, is tremendously difficult to explain. So let me just say, running an experiment with Salesforce, where we are mapping in real time people's bias. Create a giant AI, it tracks every decision you make, and so then we send out messages that say, oh, manager X, you are an awful bigoted person and you're fired. No, that's not what we do. Instead, what we send them is, uh, hey, manager, we're noticing that you have these inefficiencies on your team. Here are things you can do. And the goal is to deliver them in real time. So the moment you walk in to a team meeting and we're picking up, and here's a perfect example of a bias which has nothing to do with traditional biases, you have a left side bias, and so you tend to focus on one side of the room. That's a very common bias. But it's one that actually reduces the productivities of teams because socially sophisticated per people pick up on it and start sitting on your left side. And you start calling on them more and giving them more tasks, even though they're not any more qualified. Uh, I hope no one here is shocked to hear that we do the same thing with men and women. We do the same thing with blacks and whites. Can we deliver interventions in real time, just when someone needs feedback about how their behavior could actually make their team perform better rather than worse? Everyone has the ambition of being a better person. It's the actions that are hard to come by. Uh, and the last here, and I don't have time to go into it, is uh, another company of mine, ShiftGig, based in Chicago. It's an on-demand workforce. Uh, they asked me to be their chief science advisor, and um, we're building an AI marketplace. But the goal isn't to match workers with shifts and dead-end jobs that will never get them anywhere. It is to match workers with the sequence of shifts which will lift them up the economic ladder inside our company, those work experiences are specifically targeted at that individual. They get paid a wage. Uh, our company gets paid. Our clients get their services rendered. And eventually, after a few years, people move up and out of our system and get long-term jobs. It's not a charity. It's a for-profit company. This was my ask to make this work. But it turns out it's great for shift gig because we get better margins as people move up our value chain. They move from servers uh, to working in factories to working in call centers, and then it's a long-term placement. Uh, this is what AI can do to actually intervene and build better people. So this is my challenge to you to end on. Um, do you feel better 
after you've spent an hour on Facebook? Do you feel like your phone, not when you're using it, but after you've set it down, that it's made you a better person? This is my challenge to myself. For me, it's a hard rule. Technology must always challenge us. We cannot outsource who we are to a phone or an AI or robot. The simple rule is when you turn it off, you have to be a better person than when you had it on in the first place. And if it's not achieving that, we are robbing from our own future. This is my goal for AI. How do we make certain AI only makes us better? Always make certain it's challenging us. In the long run, the goal of all of these systems, the goal of the education, of the health, of restructuring the way we run our co companies, should be explicitly about making better people. That's what augmented intelligence can be. Thank you very much.